Well, welcome to Policy Exchange's event on shale gas and its policy implications. Um, policy Exchange recently published a report on this topic, and uh, you should have a copy on your chair. If you haven't got a chair or a copy, there are copies available afterwards. Um, I'm going to briefly say what we concluded in that report, but this event isn't about what I've got to say, it's about my four speakers. What, what we said in the report was shale gas has clearly had a profound effect on the US gas market, but it's uncertain what the scale and impact of it will be in the UK and in the EU. And it's this uncertainty, including the potential for an unexpectedly abundant and relatively cheap gas future, which needs to be reflected in our policy settings. We need flexibility for the electricity markets to determine the level of gas generation responding to emerging information about shale gas and other uh, uh, occurrences and about prices so that the economy can benefit from any abundant, cheap gas future. Gas is relatively low carbon and there could certainly be significant environmental benefits from gas displacing coal at a global level, but it's far from zero carbon. So what we said is we also need to strengthen the EU emissions cap, including making the cap longer, longer term and more certain, stretching it out to at least 2035, so that the market decisions about whether or not we invest in gas or use gas as a transition fuel remain consistent with long-term required carbon emissions reductions. And we expressed concern about the government's electricity market reform proposals, proposals to do more planning and direct the electricity market, because we believe these do not allow the necessary market flexibility and are predicated on predictions about gas prices that those prices will be high. Now, the policy costs of the government's electricity market reform vary dramatically depending on whether you forecast high or low carbon prices. And we need policy which is actually resilient to the range of possible gas futures. Else, the government is really gambling with energy bill payers' money and taking the risk that we make meeting carbon reductions unnecessarily expensive. <coughs> Finally, our report looked at the important questions of the local environmental impacts from the production of shale gas. Um, we, we certainly agreed that these need to be taken very seriously. But our reading of the evidence so far was that they didn't, we didn't warrant a moratorium. What was most important was that we needed to maintain a very strong regulatory regime here in the UK, learning from some of the mistakes in some parts of the US. So that's a brief policy of our report. You can read more about it. I'm delighted to welcome four distinguished speakers uh, this lunchtime. Um, the first speaker, uh, and this has changed to the advertised panelist, is Andrew Austin, Chief Executive of IGAS. IGAS set up in 2003 uh, to produce and market UK gas from <coughs> unconventional sources. Its main focus has been on coal bed methane, um, but it's also identified significant shale gas resources in the UK. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I thought it would be useful to give a little of a, bit of an overview of uh, iGas. We are one of the largest onshore oil and gas developers in the UK. Simply put, we produce hydrocarbons, both oil and gas, from both conventional and unconventional sources, such as C CBM and shale, from our sites at onshore locations in the northwest of England, North Wales, East Midlands, and in southern England. Our current production is dominated by oil. We produce around 2,600 barrels a day and around 100 barrels of oil equivalent in gas. Outside of oil production, our main focus at the moment is in commercializing extraction of coal bed methane. We believe that our coal bed methane resources alone would provide enough gas to supply 15% of the UK's needs for 15 years. We've drilled a number of pilot sites and have recently completed drilling at our Doe Green site near Warrington and are awaiting flow rate results. Our onshore acti oil activities have been ongoing in many locations since the early 1980s across the UK, and coal bed methane <coughs> for around 10 years. 
In terms of shale, the subject of today's discussion, we have significant resources across our acreage which we have yet to exploit. Shale is one form of unconventional gas, like tight gas and coal bed methane. Just to sort of back up slightly, unconventional gas is exactly the same as the gas that you get from the North Sea or from elsewhere. The only difference is that it's extracted directly from the source rock, rather than from more permeable rocks than the source rock where it's migrated over geological time. In all, we have something of the order of 215 wells operating in the UK and across more than 100 sites. Just to touch on working with local communities, for us at iGas it's essential that when carrying out operations we work with key stakeholders including government, regulators, but more importantly local communities. Wherever in the world you're looking to extract hydrocarbons, it's vital that you work with the community around you. And our activities here onshore in the UK are no different. Given that we're often operating close to communities, the responsibility to work with that community is absolutely key. In short, if we can't find a way to work with our neighbours, we're not going to be producing hydrocarbons. Working with those around us involves both understanding and full disclosure of the nature and implication of our activities. It's our experience and understanding of the importance of this engagement that has led IGAS to be in a position where we have been accepted as members of the communities in which we operate for many years. The nature of the planning process and the regulatory regime in this country has been demonstrated to ensure both strong local, uh, a strong level of local engagement prior to application and robust checks and balances on environmental impacts both above and below the surface to ensure the protection of the neighbourhood in which we operate. Let's not forget that the UK has a long and successful history of onshore hydrocarbon extraction, including the largest onshore field in Europe, which has consistently operated safely and with minimal environmental impact for many years. This success is a testament to the gold standards that have been implemented by the Environment Agency, the HSE and the planning regime. <coughs> The prospect of exploitation of unconventional gas, and particularly that surrounding shale, has raised concerns in many quarters. Most of these are based on the perception of the US experiment, <coughs> and particularly the environmental impact of these activities. The way that operators have engaged with communities they operate within has been, in many cases, severely lacking. The lack of openness in terms of water usage, the potential implications for local aquifers and the failure to disclose the constituents of liquids used to stimulate wells, along with lack of standards in well integrity, has led to a distrust of the process and the delivery. Here in the UK, we're fortunate to have long established standards applying, applying regarding the dis disclosure of fluids used, well designed and the implications for aquifers, which have been tried and tested through much drilling experience and have been found to be more than adequate. This view was recently endorsed by, the report, by a recent report from the Energy Select Committee. There seem to be four principal areas of concern when looking at exploitation of unconventional gas, in, in particular shale. The first of those is around aquifer production, uh, protection. Despite various scare stories in the US, or in North America, the EPA and others have acknowledged there is no reason for drilling activities to be considered to have an adverse impact on aquifers. <coughs> Here in the UK, this has never been the case, and the planning and environment agency regimes mean that well integrity and the nature of casing and isolation of the reservoir is foremost in the approval of any well. Post the Macondo well incident, integrity standards in the North Sea were reviewed and were found to be some of the best in the world, if not the best. And the same standards that apply offshore apply onshore. Second area of concern seems to be around the nature of fluids injected into the formation. Due to variations made to the US Clean Water Act and employed in several states, there has been a lack of transparency in terms of what fluids and the chemical com composition of those fluids injected in shale wells. This is not only not this is not only bad practice, but it's also not possible in the UK, as the Environment Agency requires full disclosure as part of well planning. The third area of concern seems to be <coughs> around um, seismic events and earthquakes in Blackpool. Seismic events at a low level are common in the UK and usually go unnoticed. 
Only last week, Manchester experienced a quake measuring 2.5 on the Richter scale. While the extractive industries, particularly coal mining, were in their heyday, these events were very common. Widespread research measuring the impact of such activities on seismic events exists. However, we need to be more rigorous than previous industries, such as coal mining, have been, that the impact of, <clears throat> to ensure that the impact of shale gas extraction has a minimal in, uh, impact at the surface. To this end, we fully support the monitoring and dynamic response of drilling activities to seismicity and the limiting of such impacts <coughs> to levels acceptable in the locality. The fourth area of concern seems to be around the impact of hydrocarbon extraction on climate change. Hydrocarbon consumption has an impact on climate change. That is a fact. However, the nature of the consumption differs in its impact. For instance, the burning of coal has a greater impact than the burning of gas. Furthermore, burning imported coal has a much greater impact than burning local coal. Similarly, the parasitic impact of importing gas means that emissions arising from Middle Eastern-based LNG or imported Russian gas are much greater than those arising from gas sourced locally and consumed locally. These savings are typically 15 to 30 percent in terms of emissions. <coughs> so much has been made of the impact of the negative impact locally of developing shale gas, but let's look at the benefits. While we would all rather a world with zero carbon consumed in the delivery of our energy, we have to be a, a realistic about the times when the sun does not shine and the wind does not blow, combined with the specific risks around nuclear energy. <laughs> We will undoubtedly, for a considerable period of time, require hydrocarbons to be a material part of the energy mix. And I would suggest to you that locally sourced gas offers the best option in delivering secure supply, a materially lower carbon footprint than coal, and a lower footprint than imported gas. <clears throat> Let's also not forget that from a standing start at the turn of the century, I feel strange saying turn of the century, <laughs> Shale gas is now sustaining more than 600,000 jobs in the US and has enhanced the competitive position of US industry as a result of cheaper energy. And more importantly, has lowered domestic energy bills by more than 10%. We firmly believe that the production of unconventional gas or gas from unconventional resources can have a major positive impact on the UK. And this will be felt in terms of jobs, manufacturing, energy security, emissions and environmental impact, and domestic energy bills. However, this activity needs to be carried out in a way that engages with and has the confidence of the communities in which we operate. This needs world-class operational skills and gold standard regulation delivered locally, with local sensitivity and local understanding. It's our world, it's our environment. We live on a, a crowded island, and we all need to be good neighbours. To this end, IGAS is committed to onshore energy and delivering a secure future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Our next speaker is Dr. Doug Parr, Chief Scientist and uh, Policy Director at Greenpeace UK. Doug. Good. Um, thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today. Um, I thought it would be good if I went over some of the issues that seem to us to apply, particularly to shale gas. There is, of course, a strong context here, and, uh, and Andrew mentioned it, which is that I'm afraid we will be burning gas for some time to come. Um, and our position, just so we're clear about it, is that we do see gas as a transitional fuel, but we don't necessarily want to see uh, exploitation of shale gas for reasons that I will come on to. Firstly, um, <coughs> Andrew did, uh, did cover this um, pretty well, which is the, uh, of, there are several concerns around, uh, around the environmental, the environmental concerns around the extraction of shale gas. Um, and first of those, um, of those three, I would say, is the local environmental impact. Now, uh, is it possible to uh, frack uh, safely 
Uh, yes. Uh, will it be done safely? That's a different question. Um, the, uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on geology, and I don't pretend to be an expert on uh, various obscure environmental regulations, but what I see before me is an environment agency that over the course of this parliament is having a decreasing uh, government grant of 23%. It's cutting jobs by a couple of thousand down to, uh, down to a bit over 10. And the, uh, an agency that has already had examples of where uh, failure of regulation has taken place. I'm not saying that they don't do some sterling work, because they do. But if one were to look at the, um, the impact of uh, distribution of incineration gas, uh, sorry, incineration um, ash uh, up at Newcastle and in other places. Uh, if one were to look at the difficulty they're having with diffuse sources of uh, water pollution now, um, and indeed other examples of failure of monitoring and regulation like the, uh, like the common fisheries policy, the fact that something can be done safely <coughs> is not the same, particularly at the moment, as saying that it will. And there are a number of environmental issues around that, particularly, I would say, the underground aquifers and wastewater disposal. Let me turn to, uh, to a second one, which is perhaps more uh, my home territory. Um, we do talk about CO2 of, uh, as being the most important, uh, most important gas, and indeed it is. Um, but looking at shale gas in particular, there is the question about the full life cycle impact of shale gas extraction. Now, shale gas is, as any of you knows, is essentially methane. Uh, methane has a global warming potential of around 23 or 25. In other words, it's, 20, it's 23 or 25 times more um, <coughs> impactful on the climate than carbon dioxide is. So you only need a, a leakage rate of a few percent uh, to mean that uh, the, any potential benefits from going down a shale gas route is completely dwarfed by the greenhouse gas impacts of leakage at the point of, uh, the point of production. Now, um, there have been, uh, um, this has been an area of some controversy, but the most recent uh, actual paper which looks at actual measurements on the ground rather than speculative and hypothesized measurements suggests that, that there is a leakage rate of about 4%. Now that puts it in the, uh, this was done by uh, the University of Colorado, it was published last month in uh, Nature. And that means, that the benefits of, uh, of shale gas um, under those circumstances where those level emissions are taking place is, uh, <coughs> as compared to the common in terms of the climate, are well, ne negligible or even the contrary. Uh, shale gas may well be worse for the climate than common. And so, um, before going at all down that route, we have one set of actual measurements, and they indicate that it's quite problematic. And it seems to us, uh, that, if nothing else, is a grounds for a moratorium on exploitation of shale gas until we know what's really going on. Um, let me uh, come now to um, the impacts on the energy system. Let's just park the idea about the whole life cycle impacts of greenhouse gas for a moment. Let's just consider it as gas. Um, the Another uh, recent paper, this one was by the University of British Columbia, looked at the uh, total uh, resource from unconventional gas, and that, that includes not just shale gas, but also uh, coal bed methane type gas. Um, now, their estimate was that on their own, <coughs> these unconventional gas resources would raise global climate, uh, <coughs> global temperatures by uh, over 2.8 degrees centigrade. <coughs> now, those of you familiar with the issue will know that um, internationally and within the EU, um, a total rise of 2 degrees centigrade has been set as a, a limit which, beyond which climate change can be considered dangerous for a whole variety of reasons. So, in other words, on their own, unconventional gas resources could bust that limit in addition to the, uh, to the warming we've experienced so far. And that's aside from all the coal, all the coal and all the oil that uh, pretty much inevitably is going to be burnt over the next uh, few decades. So, the um, the question about 
um, what shale gas can do for the energy system cannot be addressed simply by saying, well, it might be able to substitute for a bit of coal. Because where I'm with the, the policy exchange report is that if there is the possibility of a significant amount of, uh, of unconventional gas like shale gas, then climate protection demands that we turn towards conditions of use. Even if um, gas has displaced coal use in the US, for which there is good evidence, I have to say, even if it might displace uh, coal use in China, which is a bit more difficult to estimate, but might well be true, it doesn't really help us very much if all it does is delay that coal burn until later. We have to turn to the question of what is being used, how much is being used, and what we should do instead. Um, now, uh, again, I turn to the uh, scientific literature because another recent paper from the Carnegie Institute, led by Carnegie Institute, said that to have a, uh, in terms of deployment now of energy technologies, Having a substantial climate benefits in the second half of the century requires that, uh, quote, conservation, wind, solar, nuclear power, and possibly carbon capture and storage appear to achieve these benefits. However, natural gas cannot. So the transition to, to delivering good climate policy and making definite impacts in the second half of the century requires that we don't go down the use of uh, a, a, a policy that is <coughs> the use of gas, whether shale gas or conventional gas. And in the UK, very specifically, um, if we just follow the uh, follow the idea that we simply uh, follow, uh, simply replace um, coal with gas as the coal stations close, it means that uh, by 2030, uh, our emissions in, uh, in from the UK electricity system. Uh, would be at about 300 grams per kilowatt hour. Now, for reference, our, our current emissions are somewhere around about 500, but the Climate Change Committee's target says it needs to be about 50, and government are talking more about 100. So you can see that a straight replacement of gas for coal simply doesn't deliver um, the sort of impacts that we need. I'm, I'm grateful to uh, WWF for providing that, that analysis. So. Um, we need to think through limitations of use of fossil fuels of all sorts. Uh, and so, again, I'm with, um, I'm with um, uh, the policy exchange on, uh, on how uh, that, that the direction of travel in terms of tightening the uh, emissions trading scheme is, um, is absolutely the right place to be. Um, I would actually say that there needs to be a whole range of other measures, which I'm very happy to debate, and I'm uh, I know in the policy exchange uh, halls to say that I'm a big supporter of offshore wind is, uh, is like speaking of uh, in the, jaw, in the, in the jaws of hell, but I am a big supporter of offshore wind. I continue to think that's one of the few things that uh, the UK can really contribute to the world in, uh, in terms of technology development. Um, so, uh, in conclusion, I would also say that there are these, uh, these environmental impacts that would seriously question whether a shale gas revolution is good or appropriate or should be allowed to, uh, to go forward. And just in case anybody does think that going forward with a shale gas revolution is going to transform prices and that uh, we shouldn't bother with the, cost, uh, the costs of climate policy, uh, do bear in mind that um, Poiri and Deutsche Bank have both said they expect the impact of shale gas on European gas prices to be uh, fairly low um, because the whilst the rebel the, uh, and Deutsche Bank directly quoting saying those waiting for a shale gas revolution outside the US US will likely be disappointed. So okay. I've got to sorry another, another minute another minute yes I'm about to stop actually um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think um, we should go into this thinking that shale gas is any kind of nirvana for our energy system. It shouldn't be considered a nirvana for our energy system, and we need to approach it with considerable caution. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, right,
turn to our third speaker, who is Dr. Pierre Noel, who is a research associate at the Electricity Policy Research Group at Cambridge University. Can I speak from here? Uh, if you prefer, yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me because of that or despite of that? <laughs> no, it seems to work. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, for, for inviting me. Um, so, um, I'm part of a research group at the University of Cambridge and we are funded primarily uh, by the UK Research Council through, research, through various research grants. We also have uh, corporate and institutional sponsors. We have eight or nine energy companies who contribute to our research, plus DEC and Ofgem and uh, also policy making agencies from, uh, from other countries. So, um, everything I wanted to say, nearly everything I wanted to say has been touched upon. So, uh, I apologize for that, but you know, we're, we're sort of laboring on a very uh, narrow uh, field to some extent. So, uh, there was a, uh, bound to be some, some overlap. The thing I want to start with is I know very little about what makes Shea gas special and what makes Shea gas special is everything upstream of the pipeline if you want. It's essentially exploration and extraction. But once it is in the pipeline, it's methane, it's natural gas, it's gas as any other gas. And so what I want to talk about is I want to give some energy policy considerations about natural gas because I think that's what should be the the core of the of the discussions. Not that the uh, local environmental impact of shale gas exploration and extraction are not important, but I think they should be dealt with dealt with for what they are, which is they're not an energy policy issue. They are a water pollution issue, an air pollution issue, uh, 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 a noise issue, and and that. These are important considerations, but I think uh, they are uh, outside of the energy policy scope. So I want to ask four questions. Uh, is gas, natural gas, bad for energy security? Is natural gas good for climate change? Can we know future gas prices and what does that mean for our energy policy? And I will end with, with a, a, a factual uh, check. Is Europe currently going for gas? So, is gas bad for energy security? My very clear answer is no. Uh, in this country, over the past five, six, seven years, there has been uh, very significant concerns uh, about the transition from self-sufficiency in natural gas to being a large importer of uh, huge reliance <coughs> on international gas markets. Those concerns are, uh, I think, vastly overdone. They are mostly based on misconceptions about what the risks are and how these markets work. Essentially, in a nutshell, the UK is now part of a tightly integrated Northwest European gas market, which is one of the largest gas markets in the world. This gas market is increasingly a trading market, by which I mean that the spot price for gas is increasingly the uh, price reference for everybody except residential customers across this market and including for a growing share of residential customers by the way uh, and gas whatever gas is available in this market be withdrawn from storage or uh, uh, produced locally or imported is allocated by, by the market to whoever can pay for it and trading as actually uh, 
ensured complete price convergence across this Northwest European market. This market is itself now integrated into an international gas market that is much wider than what used to be the regional European supply system with Russia, Norway, and Nigeria. And now you have a sort of system of a, a competition for the marginal cubic meter of gas between the traditional pipe gas into the European system and the uh, global LNG market. What does that mean for the UK? It means that uh, the, the price elasticity, the short-term price elasticity of gas is much higher than uh, what people think. If the market is tight, the UK market, which has huge import capacity way beyond peak demand, can attract gas from either the European system or the global LNG market, or both. And, uh, uh, and security is ensured like that. Um, what is true is that the UK as a cheap gas island is over and no level of intervention into the gas market will bring it back. The price of gas in this country will now be forever, <coughs> that's a, as far as the eye can see, the gas price in this country will be the international price for gas. There's nothing politicians can do about that. <coughs> if politicians want to move away from gas completely, that can be done at a cost, uh, but they have to say it and do it, as opposed to intervening in the market in the name of energy security, uh, which I think is not a problem of the UK's. Is gas good for climate change? <coughs> that has already been covered. The answer, I think, is Potentially, but not necessarily. Uh, gas is about half as carbon intensive as coal in power generation, and the world burns a huge lot of coal. Uh, not only the wider world, but even this country and Europe, generally speaking, is still fairly coal intensive, much more than people would like to acknowledge. Uh, the problem is that you know, the idea that gas will spontaneously <coughs> displace coal is not supported by economics. Yeah. Uh, even in the US, um, where gas is absurd and has been, you know, the price has been going down for three and a half years consistently, what happens is as people start shifting from coal to gas, the price of coal goes down, as you would expect. And so the, the, the lesson is, if you want gas to work towards your climate change targets, you have to make sure that people who consume gas or coal make their choices on the price of commodity plus carbon, not just commodity. In other words, gas can work for, towards your climate change targets or objectives, your decarbonization objectives, provided you have an effective carbon policy. And that means, one way or another, pricing carbon emissions, or also uh, can mean regulating, uh, regulating coal away from the system, which is basically what the Obama administration is doing, because they failed to, uh, uh, they failed to put in place, they failed politically to put in place a, a carbon market. They are now going back to the old-fashioned, uh, heavy-handed regulatory way and they will push, uh, I don't have num precise numbers in mind, but a huge number of gigawatts of coal out of the US electricity system. Most of that, will, if not all of that, will be replaced by gas. I much prefer carbon pricing, but both, I mean, I'm not advocating anything here, and, and but the point is, if you want gas to be good for climate change, you have to have sensible climate policies <coughs> on its own, it will not deliver. Uh, in the longer term, gas um, cannot be part of a long-term uh, ambitious climate policy. So 
that doesn't mean you have to decide administratively or politically when you will stop consuming gas or what will be your gas consumption trajectory. That means exactly what Simon said at the very beginning, which is you have to have a, a carbon price mechanism that is long term, that is and that is credible, and then you let you let uh, people adapt to whatever your climate change policy, the climate change targets are, and that may mean that uh, you will have either gas being displaced by uh, zero carbon technologies or you will have uh, um, carbon capture and sequestration mm -hmm. that will have uh, come of age and the cost of which will have gone down and will it allow fossil fuels to still compete uh, against zero carbon technologies in the low carbon long term future. Can we know future gas prices? Well, the firm answer is no. <coughs> we, 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 we simply don't know what the price of gas will be in 15 years. Whatever number you can read is not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, I, I looked back at what nearly 30 years, 28 years, of US Energy Information Administration projection for the US price of gas. It's all over the place in the graph. It's like a spaghetti, you know, a plate of spaghetti. It's literally all over the place. When the price is low, uh, those type of agencies project the price will stay low forever. When the price goes up, the next year they move up their projection a bit. They move it up a bit again when the price goes to the roof. Then the price collapses and they say, oops, we, you know, our projection is wrong. We have to have a more realistic one and they take that pretty In other words, they don't know and I think we can't know. What does that mean? And again, Okay, I, I don't need more than that. Uh, it means that it would be foolish to have a decarbonization policy that is based on cheap gas, on you know, just cheap gas as a climate policy doesn't make sense. Uh, but it's also very risky to have a decarbonization policy that is based on expensive gas to make your subsidized renewables and nuclear look cheap. Because again, as Simon said very briefly at the beginning, but very, I think, sensibly, this is essentially gambling with, uh, with uh, electricity, with energy consumers' money. So you should have a sensible, credible, long-term carbon pricing regime that will let people make choices, uh, long-term choices about and bets with their own money about what they want to, to generate electricity. <coughs> to conclude, uh, just a bit of reality check about gas consumption in Europe. It's collapsing. Yeah, Europe is not going into gas. Europe is, and it's a fact, it's not something I'm pleased about or depressed about. Europe is moving out of gas. Uh, <laughs> gas consumption peaked in Europe three years before the financial crisis hit. And it's been going down consistently since. Um, and this is because of two things. This is because of high prices. We have a gas oligopoly around Europe which is destroying their own market. It's not my problem, it's, it's their problem. Uh, it's gas problem uh, and Statoil and Sonatrach's problem. They should think very hard about that. Um, people are, because of the high prices, people are investing significantly in Europe in insulating their homes, changing their boilers. In this country, there is a, there is a lot going on in uh, reducing domestic gas consumption. This has nothing to do with the government's climate policy. It has everything to do with the price of gas going up. Going up. In 2011, if you take the seven biggest gas markets in Europe, which represent 85% of total EU consumption, Gas consumption went down 44 billion cubic meters compared to 2010. That's roughly half the UK market, or half the German market. 22 BCM, so half of that was due to the weather, to be honest. That leaves 22 BCM that is not due to the weather. And that a, a bit less than half of those 22, so about 10 BCM, was in the UK. The UK gas market declined by about 10% in one year, adjusted for the weather. In electric and the second factor is electricity generation, which is the sort of natural, which would be the natural growth market for gas 
if we had a sensible climate change policy. But Europe is moving away from its climate change policy and into a renewable energy policy. And for gas, the consequence is not at all the same. Because we have a cap and trade regime, if you push renewable under the cap, you depress the price of carbon so that people can emit more coal. And you have coal and renewables displacing gas. You see that happening very clearly in Germany, but in very clearly in Spain. In Spain, since <coughs> 2009, gas generation has gone down by 4 terawatt hour uh, a year. Uh, wind has gone up by 2, and coal has gone up by 2, so it all adds up. Uh, coal and renewables are displacing gas, which of course, it just moves emissions around, it doesn't reduce emissions. Uh, if we had a policy which was based, uh, instead of having a policy which is based on green jobs in China and coal jobs in Europe, if we had a policy which is based on really addressing the climate, the, the emissions issue, we would have in the short and medium term gas displacing coal to uh, all the extent that the economics allow, uh, and that would be very good for gas suppliers, but it's not, it's not the direction that Europe is taking. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. I'm now delighted to introduce Tom Braintrix, the Shadow Minister for Energy, whose responsibilities include oil, gas, and electricity market. Tom, uh, thank you very much, um, Simon. I know being the last and the before between everyone and questions and answers that I'm probably under even more pressure to try to uh, keep to time so that um, you will you know, shout when I get close to the, end, to the end of time um, uh, to, to, to maximise the opportunity of the debate. I think this is a very interesting and important issue and I do congratulate Policy Exchange on, um, on your report which I think was, um, was a very good contribution to, to this, this debate. I'm looking around the room I've seen a number of people who I've met within the past couple of months or two or three months to discuss some of these issues so um, those people won't be surprised to hear me repeat what I always say at the start of this is that I don't come to this debate from an ideological position of being either someone who claims this as a revolution that will uh, reduce gas prices and save the world or um, from a position that necessarily that a moratorium um, is, is the right position to take. Um, I was interested in what Andrew was saying, particularly around some of the uh, comparisons with uh, what's happened in the USA, because I think that has largely informed and sometimes misinformed the debate in this country, because we um, have all, I think, on well, everyone's probably seen Gasland, and probably everyone's seen the clip that's on YouTube of the turning on this tap and the wall of flame and everything else, that um, uh, I see as being a result of a pretty lax process in terms of regulation that was born from a very uh, uh, scant level of knowledge um, that I think we need to address in this country. And what I wanted to do was to make a few remarks about the tests I think the uh, regulatory regime and the government need to be sure are met before any decision is taken uh, to recommend activity in the UK in, in Lancashire but or for any other activity elsewhere because um, whilst fracking is not new and again people who've read the policy exchange report will have seen some of the interesting history of it, the change in recent years, the development in technology in recent years does mean that there are a number of aspects that um, we frankly uh, don't um, have enough baseline information about. Part of the problem as I see it is also that the regulation as it currently exists is fragmented it's across a whole range of different bodies, um, and again, Andrew uh, uh, listed those, including the, the Royal Environment Agency and the Scotland Sea, but um, DEC, uh, the Health and Safety Executive, and obviously the <coughs> planning authorities as well. And the risk with that, um, and uh, Doug talked about coming, you know, the jewels of hell to talk to uh, policy exchange audience we mentioned uh, offshore wind. Well, I sort of going to do this in terms of talking about regulation, but I do think that um, the problem partly has been is that the, there's a re real risk of confusion and miscommunication when you have a fragmented uh, regulatory structure. Um, and I have asked a number of parliamentary questions around 
around this, and some of you may have seen some of those, which uh, frankly astonish me that the Environment Agency has one person who works on shale gas. Now, I think that's something that, for the interest and confidence um, that there needs to be, and comfort that people need to need to have, that that needs to change, and that with it, with it will come with cost, and that cost, I think, will need to be borne by the industry, because I don't think it's um, appropriate at this time with other pressures that it's done in any other way. But then but I think the government should also look at having a coordinating union from within those relevant bodies to oversee activity and uh, to ensure that information in relation to each potential site uh, is published online. Again, just quickly rattle through a few of the things that I think need to be addressed in terms of regulation. The chemical mix, um, again, in terms of the fluid is something which Andrew referred to. Um, and I agree with him about the lack of transparency and control in the USA, um, and that has caused uh, uh, a number of the concerns that have been, that have been expressed. Um, and whilst uh, it's the case that in the UK the Environment Agency do require um, that information to be made available, I think they need to go a bit further, which is that that should be published and made publicly available <coughs> uh, uh, as a matter of course, and that the chemical mix uh, should be restricted uh, in terms of its toxicity as well, because I think that's something where there are legitimate concerns that should be addressed. Well integrity is obviously uh, pretty fundamental to this, um, uh, to prevent uh, contamination, um, and that independent assessment of the well design that happens, um, I think needs to be stronger, particularly looking at the cement bond between the casing well bore, um, as well as the composition of the casing to ter determine its ability to resist, to resist corrosion. Um, seismic activity, as we uh, all know from uh, what's happened uh, in and around Blackpool, again, has caused a degree of concern. Um, I think there it's, uh, it's important that baseline conditions are assessed prior to any exploratory work, and again, it's something which um, I think uh, hasn't happened and should happen, again, as a matter of course, and, and the micro seismic monitoring um, so we can discriminate between what is natural seismic activity and artificial <coughs> seismic activity in the first place and the type of system uh, operating in Netherlands and Germany, which I think our colleague Andrew Dub referred to as well, which again um, I think will help to ensure measures can be taken before there's a uh, uh, significant impact. Fourthly, the level of uh, methane and, and other elements within groundwater Again, should be assessed prior to any drilling, as everybody in here knows that methane can occur naturally in groundwater, uh, but it doesn't always. Um, but without having that baseline information, again, we don't know of the impact. Uh, and I think that's something um, which needs to be, uh, to be properly measured. And, f and fifthly, um, there has been a concern expressed, which I, I have a great deal of uh, a great deal of sympathy with around environmental impact assessments, because. Mm -hmm. As people will know, that if the site is, uh, I think it's less than one hectare, then the environment, environmental impact assessment process doesn't doesn't apply. Um, I think all exploration sites should be subject to the screening for environmental impact assessment because the, we shouldn't overestimate the concern that comes from the impact on the local environment. And again, having a degree of uh, of detailed examination of those things uh, can help to provide. Uh, provide the uh, comfort and, and confidence that's required. Now, again, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm sure we'll come over onto some of the climate change aspects within the, within the questions, but I did want to really set out those tests that I think need to be met before any decision is taken at any particular site to uh, commence or recommence activity. Now, in some senses, that'll be something that won't be welcome to, uh, to some of the uh, companies and interests uh, in, ex uh, in potential extraction of shale gas, but I think it's hugely important that we start from a basis where we understand uh, what we're dealing with, where we understand uh, the uh, conditions, where there is uh, a, a, a regulatory regime which does address the very legitimate concerns that have been expressed, and from then it becomes a decision that is around energy issues and its decision that's made uh, uh, depending on the economics and the, uh, and the, uh, and the energy potential, um, but done on an informed basis. Because I think what has uh, happened in many other 
parts of the world hasn't necessarily been with that degree of rigor. Uh, that has, uh, to my mind, led to some of the decisions in different parts of Europe, be that Bulgaria, be that Austria, be that France, wherever, uh, uh, in relation to shale gas. And I think we need to be able to do that better in this country. We have the opportunity now, the government have the opportunity with the current uh, situation to, uh, to address those issues. Uh, and I think by addressing uh, those concerns, we then uh, open up a decision process to be made on an informed basis. Uh, and, uh, and that is a much more sensible way uh, to deal with what might or might not end up being uh, a very significant uh, process, but uh, without that information, you won't have the confidence uh, to enable that activity uh, to, uh, to explore and to find out more. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. Before we um, take questions from the floor, I want to give Andrew and Doug uh, a chance to come back on <coughs> on some of the later remarks. Um, starting off with uh, Andrew, um, you might want to comment on, on, in fact, on Doug's point about the climate impact of methane leakage, the fugitive emissions. And Doug, I thought you might want to come back on uh, one or two of Pierre's points, perhaps the tensions between a EU climate policy based on uh, carbon pricing and the ETS uh, as against a policy based on technology-specific subsidies for renewables. Um, Andrew, do you want to, do you want to, do you want to say? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'll come to that. Um, uh, thanks to all of the speakers for, for, uh, for their comments and uh, thanks for some of the supportive uh, comments towards the industry as well. Yeah, well, some of us find it a little difficult to hear. Very sure. helpful for the speakers to understand. I do apologise for just checking. Yeah. Um, my phone is on. It's muted. It says it's on. Mine says it's on, so. I'll, I'll stand here and answer the question from here if, that's it, if that makes it any easier. Um, just on the leakage point, um, I don't have any figures for the leakage uh, from any of our sites for gas, but what I, what I would struggle to see is a material difference in the way in which, well, there is no material difference in the way in which a completion is run for a, um, um, a conventional gas well to an unconventional gas well. So, you know, a well accessing a conventional reservoir and one accessing an unconventional reservoir. Therefore, any background level of leakage is going to be similar for both. So it's not a shale gas specific situation. What it also points to is that standards in other countries, global warming and the emission of, of whether it's a, a, a methane into the atmosphere, which has rightly been commented on is 20 plus times worse than, than CO2 for uh, its impact on climate change. It doesn't actually matter where in the world that happens, it will still have an impact. What we can say is that the standards that would be employed in the UK would be higher than those in several of the other um, regimes where, um, uh, um, where the conventional or, or unconventional gas wells are in terms of their leakage. So I think, I don't think it's something that's differential about shale gas, I think it's something that's an issue about the integrity and the standards by which we extract any gas wherever it comes from. Um, yeah, just picking up on the on the point about um, carbon pricing ETS versus technology. Um, well, I mean, let's be clear about it. We do support, I support, an emissions trading scheme. I support carbon pricing, and uh, you know, at the moment, engaged in trying to get uh, get those emissions trading scheme tightened, and that provides a carbon price and that provides a signal for investment. I agree with all that. It's very helpful. What I would say, though is that the, the, the carbon price in and of itself does not address the questions about investment risk. And um, let me give you an analogy. Um, fuel tax, already an issue for next year's budget. How many people would, uh, would be prepared to bet on what the level of fuel tax is going to be in three years' time? And how many people would want to come, put a couple of billion on it? Right? So if we've got a carbon price that is set through admittedly a political process, and you know, maybe all of these things have political processes enmeshed in them, um, how confident can you be to put down <coughs> a lot of money on a new piece of kit um, that is going to be uh, potentially at risk if the, if the carbon pricing doesn't come through as is hoped? Anybody who invested, uh, say, three years ago on a carbon price going up and up, um, 
at this point in time will have lost money. But that's true of anything. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Well, I know, but, um, but that's why I'm saying when, when you get with a technology-specific approach, you get uh, you direct towards um, very specific outcomes, which give you option value for, for the future, which can bring down costs. Okay, so um, I've heard it argued that a carbon tax is better than an emissions trading scheme, but that's vulnerable to exactly the same kind of problems. Um, that um, these things that are mandated or, or are dependent on political processes to deliver um, to deliver increases in price don't deal with the investment risk issue. I think yeah. we have to come back in and then we'll throw it over to the audience briefly. So the level of support to renewables is also set by the political process. Yep. First point. Yep. The Agreed. second point is the reason you want a carbon market is because it reveals the least cost way to achieve whatever target you want to achieve. If you at the same time deploy on a massive scale specific technologies, it defeats the purpose of having a carbon market in the first place. Well, no. The only it does. The only reason why you want to give money to specific technology subsidies above the carbon price is as an R and D policy. You expect that you can drive the cost down, which has nothing to do with decarbonizing your own economy with renewables. You subsidize renewables in the hope that. The, pro the cost will go down, and then they can be deployed globally by, you know, if you're talking about solar, but people have good solar conditions. Or if you're talking about onshore wind, by people who have good onshore wind conditions. Offshore wind is one absurdly costly today. So uh, deploying them now makes no sense. Uh, and has very little global deployment potential. So this is the least credible uh, choice in terms of renewable subsidies. But the main point is, you want, if, you, if you choose to rely on carbon pricing as your carbon policy, you cannot at the same time destroy it with specific uh, technology subsidies. It defeats the purpose of the carbon market. Okay, let me come back on that. Um, the problem with uh, collapsing the carbon price is that the, uh, the emissions trading scheme hasn't been tight enough. And this is now universally acknowledged and there's an attempt to tighten it because there are all these other policies that are in play to make that work. Now, the problem is, I see, is that um, the initiatives to drive through the tightening of the, of the emissions cap at the moment is, being, is running into other political difficulties, namely Poland. So, um, so the, it, it's, I, I see it perfectly fine to have technology-specific policies alongside a carbon price if you can make them work together. If you don't have that, that if it runs into the sort of difficulties that we're finding with the emissions trading scheme, an emissions trading scheme isn't going to work either, certainly not on its own. And the, um, you say that the, uh, that's the, the, the question about uncertainty is true, of, um, is true of existing policies. Yes, that is true. Um, I think it's pretty well acknowledged that on the, on the back of the UK scheme, the renewables obligation, um, developers in this country were paying a higher price for their, uh, for their borrowing than they were in other countries. Um, because there was, that, there, there was a, a sense of, that there was a political risk around the renewables obligation and that there wasn't on other uh, more developed um, policies like the feeding tariff. And finally, which one more contractual, and finally, um, I think what you're explaining here and saying let's put it all into, into R&D and, and, and make it ready for global technology deployment is uh, what I think our uh, friend from Imperial calls, Imperial College calls the innovation fairy. The idea that by doing R&D you bring down the costs and then suddenly you can deploy it globally. Well, no, actually a lot of cost reductions come by the learning by doing from actual deployment. So you have to go through that actual deployment phase to find out and deliver the sort of savings and costs that you need. This, this is a fundamentally important debate in climate policy, but I do want to bring in the audience. Mm. So I'm going to, much as I'd like that to carry on, I'm going to bring in questions now. Maybe some of the questions will be about this area. So and I'm, going to, I'm going to take them in batches as well, because a lot of people. 
So I'll, I'll take one here, one here, and then the chat staff uh, yes. So, Shoot microphone if you want to. Do you want to please sorry, say sorry. who you are yeah. and then keep the question short, please? Sure, yeah. Uh, Julian O'Halloran, BBC Current Affairs, a question to Dr. Pierre Noel. Towards the end of your presentation, you gave some fascinating numbers about the reduction in gas consumption uh, in at least a couple of places in Europe, uh, in uh, units which not all of us may know about. Are you able to put that uh, you know percentage figure, very rough ones, on the on that drop, and just discuss a tiny bit more of uh, the factors leading to that 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 significant reduction? Yeah, hi, uh, Nick Rooney, no part here. Um, you've been hearing about really arcane uh, administrative problems which can be solved, um, but we're not hearing enough about the economic benefits which, judging by analogues from North America and the rest of the world, are absolutely stunningly game-changing, substantial, and yet here we are talking about, oh, there won't be enough regulators. And then finally, I would just add to that is, it's not a shale gas, it's shale oil as well. And when the people in the UK are going to realize that maybe they can ignore gas with $115 a barrel of oil here in the UK is something that we don't want to be sitting in the gold money. <coughs> So I'm Clive Bates, I'm a civil servant, I actually used to work at Greenpeace about 20 years ago. Um, Doug, isn't there a danger here that you're making um, the perfect the enemy of the good? Um, coal is the dominant source of energy worldwide. Uh, it's uh, the biggest source of primary energy and rising. There's potentially a source of cheap displacement fuel here that would reduce carbon emissions. Shouldn't you go into seeing this as an opportunity rather than a threat? and approach it from the perspective of problem solving, working out how to get something for the climate from it, rather than trying to fight it off. Thank you. Um, Tom, do you want to start by taking next points about the economic benefits of this game change? Yeah, yeah, maybe, but I mean, just the last point, I think Clyde was just making at the end there, I have um, you seem to be a lot of sympathy for in terms of why you're not trying solve the problems because I think that is the that is the key to them being able to properly assess what the economic benefits are. And I, I mean I think at this stage as well, so the economic benefits we talk about are potential economic benefits still. There's still a lot um, of uh, of information we don't know and though but I would rather see us in a position where by addressing some of those problems it may sound very administrative and, and dull and technical and about you know giving people comfort and everything else. But I think Addressing those then enables the debate to be then properly around the economic benefits on one side and also the uh, energy and climate change issues, and then it becomes a much more, I think, informed position to, to start from. So that's basically what I sort of broadly agree with what Clive said, and that's sort of the answer to, to Nick's point, I think. Uh, Pierre, do you want to take the point about your units? <coughs> oh, okay, uh, I, I will try. So basically, the UK market is 90 whatever the units. The German market is 90. The European market is, is a bit less than 500. Okay? And uh, adjusted for temperature, last year, the European market declined by 22. So, you know, between a fifth and a quarter of one of the largest markets <coughs> like the UK or Germany. Did that answer it? Okay, great. Okay, and Doug, did you want to take um, five slides? Yeah, uh, sure. Well, firstly, um, underlying all this is that, um, that this is good. And the second point of my presentation was about the only set of measurements that have been made on uh, what's actually gone on with shale gas in terms of actual emissions, and that says, hey, there could be a problem. Now, as I said, you can factor all that out and just look, let's put that on one side, let's pretend that isn't happening, um, because I am mindful of what Andrew said, you know, we don't know where it is, we might be able to manage it, it might be feasible, and say, let's just look at it in terms of energy. 
and where energy is used. Now, as far as I'm concerned, under those circumstances, um, displacement, particularly in China, of, uh, of coal would be a, a good thing. It's got to be. Um, I think it's difficult to say what exactly the baseline is with China. So it's, you know, what, 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 what would they have done anyway? What would they have done without it? Because they're developing all sorts of other stuff as well. So the baseline issue around China is difficult. I think there is good evidence that it's displacing um, coal in the US, at least on a, on a temporary basis. But I come back to the point that um, I'm perfectly at ease with the idea that um, gas is a transitional fuel. Um, because we and others are going to be burning quite a lot of it for quite some time. But what I don't want to find out is that this is just a, uh, this has just bought us a bit of time before we burn all that coal that we were going to burn anyway. So it comes down to what are the conditions of use attached to shale gas. And if we're at the point of a transition, then the politics suggest that there should be some scope for change. And uh, that's the sort of change that I will see along the lines of the sort that, um, that uh, is in the policy exchange report, but also some other stuff as well, as I've been discussing with Pierre. Yeah. Okay, next questions. Um, so one from Benny. Um, I'm okay, the chat in the middle here, and David. Eddie Pizer, um, Global Warming Policy Foundation. Um, I, I find it interesting that on this issue it would appear that the, the green movement is totally isolated. It would appear. My question is really to Tom, because I remember that the Labour Party used to call for a moratorium uh, after the year so, uh, From your talk, it would appear that you've become a bit more open to the idea of uh, exploration. And I'd like to hear why you've opened up and, and become a bit perhaps, as you said, a bit more pragmatic rather than ideological. And um, what does this debate actually tell us about the whole um, fear that shale gas, the whole shale gas development over the last two years is essentially competing, not just with renewables, but also with coal and, and nuclear, and the kind of threat shale, cheap natural gas poses to other forms of nuclear. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric Lawrence, your member of Parliament for the Lancaster and Fleetwood. <coughs> I just want to follow up on that gentleman on the economics, and particularly the local economics. There's a situation uh, in Lancaster where we've got shale gas. We've also got, we've got uh, wind turbines which have gone out at sea, planned by the last government. We're now being faced by the fact that those turbines aren't built here, so nobody's getting jobs out of it in my district. On top of that, they're now transmission lines have got to come from the wind turbines out at sea, which are going to be brand new pylons, of substantial size, built somewhere else, but constructed right across the middle of Lancashire. We've also got to, um, four miles from Preezall, but I have a Preezall also in my constituency where there's an application to store liquefied natural gas brought from abroad in salt mines. And the whole purpose of transit is locally, there seems to be very little benefit. And given the English planning system, Unless you've got local people on site, the cost factor of getting through the planning system is going to substantially prevent anything. Because I may have the reference in policy exchange here to American has one reference uh, to local residents who might get some money for leasing their land. Well, actually, in Lancashire, the majority of mineral rights are still held by the Duchy of Lancaster, and even if you buy land off the Duchy of Lancaster, you don't have the mineral rights, so there's no gain there. And the business rates are pretty small as far as I can see and the employment rates in terms of shale gas are also pretty small, let alone the impact on areas of outstanding natural beauty. So there is a, if you like, a regional issue about where all this factor is coming and that is going to be a cost eventually. Thank you. Uh, David Arthur, Morning Gas UK. Just pick up on this question of fugitive emissions. Uh, and the comments of Doug make. I mean, I, I really don't know where the 4% came from, because uh, wells are properly constructed don't leak. Um, but never mind, I put that on one side, and I thought your arithmetic about comparing that with coal seemed pretty strange. But the question I wanted to come to is, you didn't make any mention of future emissions with respect to coal. Now, are we seriously suggesting that coal extraction, which does not have 
uh, casing, cementing, various layers of casing, all the controls that that imposes, has zero fugitive emissions. As far as I know, all the evidence is there's an awful lot of fugitive emissions. Okay, thank you. Um, Tom, do you want to come in first? Or yeah, that's the question. Um, I think, Benny, um, I'm not sure that the point you made about uh, plentiful and cheap was necessarily going to turn out to be exactly the case. And I think that's something um, which, again, I suppose is the other end of this of this spectrum you're talking about in terms of the Labour Party's position. But um, uh, on this, I just take a pragmatic view that we need to address the concerns and deal with the evidence and make a decision from there. Now, our previous position, uh, our previous iteration position in relation to moratorium, I think was at a time when uh, there were less, there was less debate and there were less issues that were, were, that were known about. There's still a lot of information we don't have, so uh, I wouldn't want uh, you or anyone else to go away from this uh, thinking that the uh, Labour position is just go on and get on with that and it's going to solve one problems because that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, but what I am saying is that we should be open to it and we should, uh, we should address some of those concerns, which again, you know, people may say is being administrative, but they are important and then make a decision based on the economics and the energy policy mix that has informed most of the discussion. Um, what was the other question on the and local impact on planning? Yeah, um, well, I've, I mean, we sort of had a debate about some of this stuff yesterday, Eric, um, uh, in the chamber around, uh, you know, the way in which uh, in some different parts of the world it seems that the local economic benefit is much more uh, advanced than we managed to do, and I think that's something for all of us to seek to address. And Andrew, do you want to come up on that? Yes, well, if I may. Um, the nature of, of, of uh, delivering hydrocarbons on shore, thank you. The nature of delivering hydrocarbons on shore is actually a lot more labour intensive and necessitates local jobs anyway. So we, for instance, employ 160 people locally across the areas in which we operate, primarily in, in um, Hampshire and Sussex and also in um, uh, Lincolnshire and North, uh, North, Northamptonshire and uh, Nottinghamshire. So um, I think it is more labour intensive and those are local jobs. So if you work for um, us delivering um, uh, oil at our Gainsborough facilities, you are not likely um, the next minute to go off and get on somebody else's helicopter and fly off to another uh, platform elsewhere foreign owned in the North Sea. Um, you're going to work um, on those assets locally. And that actually comes through in our in our staffing levels, which we have a lot of people who've been involved in those assets for many, many years. You know, some of them maybe 20, 30 years working with those same assets on shore. So I do think there is a little jobs argument about hydrocarbon extraction on shore. Um, I think that's a different argument about bringing kit in in terms of wind and in terms of LNG and, and, and whatever. But as far as hydrocarbon extraction, we've got empirical evidence of it generating local jobs. And I think that does need to be taken into account in the planning um, regime. And I think um, I hope the message came through of what I was saying was that we can only operate onshore with the acquiescence of the community we work in, the community we, we have to function within. And that's about making sure they're properly informed, they properly understand what's going on, and properly understand the local benefits. And once that's been um, uh, understood by both sides of what the give gets on that arm, then hopefully we can work together as we've done elsewhere in the country to be able to deliver a uh, local hydrocarbons. Done. Uh, yes, just, uh, just to come back on Eric's point, actually, uh, I mean, I think it is important because I, you know, I've actually been quite critical of the wind industry in terms of how well they've, uh, they've measured up to the sort of community benefit schemes which are finally coming their way. I mean, frankly, <coughs> not that this, they should have done this many years ago when we were pushing them to do that. Um, but they felt they didn't need to. Um, and in terms of the, the number of jobs that are available, well, um, actually the, the jobs have gone to countries that have adopted technology-specific policies. Uh, they've gone to Denmark and Germany, who actually, uh, who actually decided to invest in their, in their wind industry, and they're now building it over here. Now, with offshore wind, on the other hand, uh, we've got Siemens, Gamesa, Vestas, GE, and lots of others who I've forgotten, who are looking to build factories here, and then the, the proportion of, uh, of take of the UK jobs and economics would be a great deal higher than the onshore wind developments that we've seen so far. David, uh, on the point about fugitive emissions, the 4% figure uh, came from a figure that was published in Nature on 7th of February. It's the first set of measurements that have actually been done, are actual measurements, as I emphasise, 
not theoretical estimates based on um, based on industrial analyses of what should what should happen at this point, but actual measurements um, that were done near Colorado by NOAA and uh, the University of uh, the University of Colorado. Um, will there be fugitive emissions around coal? Yes, I'm sure there will. Um, frankly, I see the reasons for getting rid of coal as being enormous, um, irrespective of a few fugitive emissions. Uh, and even, even China, mercifully, is now waking up to the fact that um, what it does to people's health um, in, in terms of air pollution as well as mining is, uh, makes it unacceptable. Okay, I think we've got time for three more questions. Uh, yes, the gentleman. <coughs> Alan Riley, City University. Uh, my question, um, I've, got, I've got two questions, I'll be very brief, but one of them is simply about prices and the impact of, 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 on the, the economy of shell gas. In, in Europe, already there has been an impact. The uh, effect of the US shell gas revolution has resulted in the dumping of energy in the European markets. So you saw gas from actually having to give discounts to its customers in order so that they could maintain market share. And in fact, the reason why I think at the moment uh, you see a series of arbitration cases going uh, on uh, in relation to the link between oil and gas, which is in, uh, in all uh, gas bond contracts. And AWE, AL, and other companies have brought these, is because of the fear of all those companies that are on a wave of LNG coming down the line, even if shale gas isn't developed in Europe and being dumped in the European market. That's not going on at the moment. There's been a rise in prices because of Fukushima and other effects, and there's not enough LNG carriers. <coughs> the point about it is, is they see more uh, gas coming into Europe because of the destruction of demand for LNG in other parts of the world. Now, so even if even if Europe doesn't develop shale gas, we are going to be faced with an impact of shale gas in the European markets. That's my first point. My second point, and um, this is really kind of addressed to really, is that what I don't understand is that there are 50, the IEA says there are already 1,500 people, 1,500 million people on the planet. Uh, without access to power. And they say, if we're very lucky in 30 years' time, it can still be only 1,500 million. And the danger is that huge demand for power will be basically soaked up with coal. If, we, if, if there is huge amounts of shale gas on the planet, which apparently there is, and they can access that, that, at the very least, you're limiting climate emissions in very, part, uh, very poor parts of the world. Now, clearly, we want to go beyond that and then use gas as a transitional fuel. But surely it is you know, the perfect, clearly here is the enemy of the good. Because if we don't use that gas, coal will be used, and the consequences of that will be much, much worse. Another um, more, more practical question in some of these, these higher level debates. I wonder if the panel could comment on the relative economics in Europe for shell gas. Sorry, who? Oh, sorry, all dumping on from country insights. Um, particularly around availability of land rigs, availability of crews, the need to do horizontal completions. How does that change the possible economics of the industry? Hi, I'm uh, Sam Peacock from SSE, Scottish and Southern Energy. Um, I just had a quick question on whether the panel thought that the emergence of shale accelerated the need or not to demonstrate to CCS on gas. Uh, I declare an interest because we have the TED <coughs> project, but it, it is, I think, very topical given that CCS has been mentioned by Pierre earlier today. And lastly, the lady. Excellent, Alan. Uh, thank you. My name is Isabella Ambrucht, and I'm from the Kościuszko Institute from Poland. Uh, as you might know, uh, Poland uh, is at the beginning of the shell gas uh, revolution. And, um, well, I uh, congrats on this uh, report and like my fingers crossed to uh, make a successful launch of this report at uh, number 10. Because as I understand, you need also the political acceptance for shell gas development in the UK. And uh, what I want to um, say is that um, you are very much concentrated now on the UK um, point of view when it comes to Shell, but mm, Poland at, at this moment is facing also some, well, let's say, political difficulties on the EU level, 
um, because you must know that um, shell gas uh, sector um, is not in favor of uh, some member states. So uh, what I want to say is that UK and Poland um, should also concentrate on uh, EU level when it comes to uh, shell gas uh, development. Uh, and I think it is uh, very important to cooperate and build the coalition for a uh, shell gas uh, sector uh, in the EU. Uh, EU. Um, uh, first of all, uh, well, it was said that uh, the consumption of gas is uh, diminishing in Europe, so we, we need to think how to create the gas market in Europe to, uh, to, uh, to, to have the place to put this gas, which might be, um, might be, um, uh, you know, is really, might be produced in the, from the shell in, in, in EU. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm now going to let all the panel members mm -hmm. have their last word before responding to to these four questions. Andrew, do you want to start off, perhaps particularly taking the question on the economics, developing economics for the industry? Um, the economics of, um, uh, of, of, of any unconventional gas ultimately come down to the flow rate at which it comes out the ground. Um, so, you know, what one needs to do at this stage in development, whether it's here or in Poland, is actually demonstrate that the flow rates can be at a level at which one can make it economic. And that's what we've been carrying out with Colbert Methane and others have been looking to look at in the case of, in the case of shale. In terms of the availability of land rigs, there are rigs around, but the service providers are eager to um, um, supply once they see a market for um, uh, 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 for those rigs, and basically people can demonstrate the economics that you can flow at the right level. So I think if you drill a shell well right now, it will cost you an awful lot of, web, an awful lot of money, uh, but that's the same as it was uh, when Mitchell drilling were drilling for shale back in the States in, um, in, in the latter part of the last century, the beginning of this century. So um, it, through that, the, the cost of drilling will come down once you've demonstrated you can flow it at the right rates. What you can't change is, well, you can only um, uh, make small differentials to it, the rate at which it comes out of the ground. So you know, when you look at shale or you look at coal in the UK, we know we've got rocks, we know we've got gas in the rocks. What we've got to demonstrate, we know we've got a market for that gas um, uh, once, we've, once we've produced it. But what we need to demonstrate is actually the rate at which we can make it come out of the ground. Part of that is down to the geological conditions we're dealing in. Part of that is down to the way in which we complete those wells and the technologies we use that are locally specific to make that work. So um, right now, could you drill an economic shale well in, in the UK? Probably not. But could you demonstrate you can make shale uh, gas from shell flow at a rate which could be economic potentially, yes. So it's a long-winded way of answering the question, but it's not that straightforward. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, well, the, 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 there's been comments which have interested me, but there was no really specific question, so I'm going to make a statement of my own. But there was a question about CCS. But I don't quite know what to answer to that. You know, does shale, the, the answer would be question was, <laughs> does shale gas make it more interesting or urgent or whatever to demonstrate CCS for gas? You know, I think we have to move away from this type of question. We, we, we have to have a portfolio of R&D investment into low carbon technologies. And, and we'll see what works, you know. Uh, shale gas in itself shouldn't change anything to our energy policy or the potential of shale gas shouldn't change anything that's actually the statement i wanted to make so it's a good uh, uh, i think there's no yeah let's read like that i think there is no energy security premium that would justify discounting the local pollution problems associated, the potential problems associated with shale gas. And on the one hand, on the other hand, sorry, I think there is no climate change reason to block the development of shale gas if shale gas there is. That's my final statement. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Doug. Um, 
Well, I, I concur with one of those things, actually. Uh, shale gas shouldn't change anything. It was a good idea to demonstrate CCS on gas before shale gas. It's a good idea now. It's a good idea to try and transition away from coal with gas supplies already. Shale gas doesn't change that. That's true in developing countries as well. And in some places it'll be appropriate to have a full grid to, do, to get to those 1,500 million people who don't have access to power. In plenty of other places, including Bihar, where my Indian colleagues are working, um, and in parts of Africa, but by far the best way of doing it is by, um, is by solar power. So what I, what I would say and really emphasize is that we shouldn't change policy on the basis of the potential of cheap and abundant gas, which may never materialize. And that, I think, is the chief danger in, uh, in British policy at the moment. Thank you. Um, <coughs> on, uh, on CCS, I could have predicted that question. Uh, coming from SSE and from Peterhead. Um, uh, but I'm mean, going to take the same position as Doug on this in that um, whether or not show is a consideration is something that we need to, uh, to move ahead with. And after long down, we need to move more quickly in seeking to demonstrate CCS because I think that will have a significant impact uh, in terms of uh, wider energy policy considerations. Um, what I disagree with Doug, I suppose, is that uh, in terms of changing policy, and I know I was talking about very specifically around the regulatory regime, I think it is, is very important that that regulatory regime is fit for purpose and that, may, that does entail a degree of change and a degree of coordination and actually a degree of additional levels of uh, public scrutiny information uh, published to, um, to properly uh, set the baseline for this debate. I agree with that. Great. That's all we have time for. This, is a, this topic, I'm sure, is going to remain near the top of the energy policy agenda. Uh, and one of the next things is to wait to get a decision on whether drilling will resume in Lancashire. Uh, I want to thank all the panel members, uh, particularly thank Tom for letting us be some of the first to hear about the Labour Party's emerging position on the regulation of shale gas. And uh, thank you all for coming and let's thank the panelists for the